we are super, super excited to be, to be chatting with you guys. Um, it's great to have you guys on our um, platform and the community and to be talking with you all today. Thanks and today, you. especially, we're very excited to be talking about the combination of performance and engagement. Um, this is something that's been near and dear to our hearts at Lattice for a really long time. Obviously, today we're going to talk about the sort of definitional um, meaning of performance and engagement. Um, but at a high level, we're going to be talking about the common understanding of each of these. Performance, um, how well are we doing? And engagement, how are we feeling? How engaged are we in our jobs? Um, we at, at Lattice have this very strong belief that these are better together, that they can be leveraged, that they can make companies stronger if you think of them together. Um, so we're really excited to be chatting with you all about this today. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jack Altman. I'm the CEO and founder here at Lattice. Um, we are a people management platform. Um, our goal is to help companies align, grow, and engage their employees. And we've been around for about three years. Actually, our third birthday was yesterday. Um, and in that time, we've managed to work with about 800 awesome customers, um, including many of you who are listening in today, um, and some great companies like Glossier, Reddit, Cruise, New Republic Radio, and a bunch of others. Um, and the, the thing that we've really believed about the world is that great products for HR teams can empower them in a way that lets them empower their managers and employees. Um, so we really care about delivering great product, about having a culture and a community that is talking about this kind of stuff. Um, and we're going to keep on doing that. And today we're really excited to talk about this sort of new um, expansion, both in our product and our philosophy around adding in employee engagement. So in today's presentation, we're going to be talking about number one, uh, as we always do, because it's something we really, really believe in, the new state of work and its impact on people management. Um, then we're going to talk about measuring employee engagement and specifically through a lens of performance data. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about how you can build management practices your own company uh, to drive better employee engagement, better performance, and healthier cultures. So to get started, um, we want to talk about how the relationship between employees and companies has changed. Um, and one great way to put it is from Josh Burson, um, who many of you know, uh, and his quote that really resonated with us was that the war for talent is over and the talent has won. And what he meant by that was in the old world, it was the case that the dynamic between employers and employees was different. It used to be the case that employees would stay at companies for much longer. Uh, it used to be the case that they had fewer options. We didn't used to have the internet, have mobile phones, have all of these things that allow employees to have so much more information today. Um, the other thing that's changed is that skills have become so transferable. So many companies have become enabled by the internet and this has uh, enabled employees to have skill sets that transfer extremely well from company to company. So as a result of all of this, the power dynamic between employees and companies has shifted towards the employees. Um, and we think that's a great thing. It means that companies can't just look at people as resources. They have to actually treat them as holistic people and they have to do things to help them grow, to help them get sort of what they're looking for out of their work. Um, but the nice thing is putting in that effort has this benefit, which that of course, in the end, that ends up helping the company more. Um, and so HR needs to build employee centric business practices in order to deal with this new world. So all of the things that HR teams used to do are now have to be reimagined and rethought of um, towards a world where employees uh, have much more, um, have sort of much more say in the process, have a much bigger sort of consideration when thinking about is performance management a way for us to simply evaluate employees or is it maybe a way for them to grow, to get feedback, to get developed and all these sorts of things. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about two extremely important people ops practices, performance and engagement. Um, and we're gonna be talking about how you can evolve those practices at your business to be more effective in sort of today's world. Um, so just quick definitions. Performance management, um, one great definition for this is it's the system in which employee productivity is maximized through management, environment, and culture. And what I love about this definition is that it's not just about um, the company. Um, you can see through the environment and through the culture. Uh, we, can, we can tell that employee productivity has a lot to do with who they're surrounded by, what the culture of their company is, do they feel satisfied, do they get purpose? So those things matter too, in addition to sort of the traditional elements of management that we think of. And when you think about how performance management has evolved, 
you can sort of look at traditional practices and then more continuous practices of today. So in the old world, performance reviews happened once a year. You can sort of look back many decades to the Jack Welch era who popularized these annual performance reviews um, where sort of the top 10% would be promoted and rewarded and the bottom 10% would sort of be culled from the organization. You contrast that today with um, ongoing performance management where we have biannual reviews, we might have quarterly check-ins, we're gonna have real-time feedback, one-on-ones between managers and employees. All of these sorts of things have evolved. Um, and in that process, we think that companies have become more agile. Um, we think that they've become more productive and employees ideally have become able to find more purpose in their, in their work. So that's performance management. Now, when we look at employee engagement and think about how do we define that, um, you might describe it as a system of motivators that drive an employee to come to work and do their best. So when you think about yourself, when are you engaged? What does that feel like? Um, one of the most sort of resonant words, and this was conducted in a pretty broad study with both HR leaders and uh, general people managers, um, this description was what resonated with people. It's that feeling that I, I have the willingness and the ability and desire to bring my best self to work and to, and to give my all to it. Um, and so you think about how valuable that can be to a company. Um, this is our version of a chart um, that was actually popularized by um, Maya, who used to work at Greenhouse and has recently become the head of people at Stripe. Um, but she described the employee lifetime value curve, the ELTV. And so just like you know, sales and customer success teams will think about the lifetime value of a customer, um, people teams are now able to think about the lifetime value of an employee. And so when you think about the value to a company over time and you think about the different phases of the employee life cycle, when you do the recruiting and then you onboard and then you do training, at the beginning, an employee is actually a big cost to an organization, but that's okay because you see all this payoff coming. And so as time goes on, the employee gets ramped up, they get comfortable with the organization. Um, you have things like development programs and recognition and management and, and all of these sorts of things that make the employee more and more productive over time and they stay with the company longer and longer. And so in this way, you can see that it engaged employees don't just deliver a little value, they deliver an enormous amount of value. So if you look at a curve like this and you see, well, if I, if I increase how high it is by 20%, or I increase the duration with, you know, with which the employee stays at the company by 20%. These things have a massive, massive value to companies over time. Um, sometimes it's estimated in the millions, it's often estimated in hundreds of thousands, but there's no doubt that highly engaged employees who are productive, giving, them be giving their best to their work and staying with companies for a long time are extremely valuable. So one of the things we've always believed at Lattice that we're really excited to share with you today is that we deeply believe that performance and engagement create a virtuous cycle. And so what we mean by that is that increased performance leads to increased engagement and increased engagement leads to increased performance. Um, this is for anybody who's been a manager or just anybody who's been working long enough. It's easy to reflect and just from our own direct experience to see that this is true. You think about the times when you've really been excelling, when you're growing quickly, when you're performing well, generally that comes with a feeling of confidence, happiness. Um, it comes with a sense of engagement and, and that, that drives sort of the level with which you want to keep improving and keep growing. And on the flip side, even if you're performing at a consistent level, if your engagement really increases, either because you got a great new manager or the direction of the company changed in a way that you really like, or something happened in your personal life that makes you feel sort of more engaged with work, that leads to more performance over time. And so we've believed for a really long time that these are connected. And so obviously with sort of the way that we've expanded our product, that's been exciting, but also just in the data we've looked at and the way we've talked to customers, that's been exciting. So one quick story before we go into um, sort of that combination and some sort of more tactical discussions. So this is Max. Max is a fictitious, uh, character for anonymity's sake, but this is a real person, and the story that I'm going to tell you is a real story who is actually happens to be an employee at Lattice now. Um, Max had worked at his last company for years. He was on the sales team. He had been consistently the top performer. Um, about a year ago, the company direction changed, and it changed in a way that meant shedding one of its business units and adding a new one. And this happens sometimes. Companies have to make strategic decisions, um, but his group had a lot of changes to it. Some people had to be let go, there was new management. And in fact, in the course of a couple of quarters, he had four new managers, 
and nobody talked to him about how he was feeling. He continued being the top performer on the sales team. He continued doing a really great job, uh, but nobody was checking in with him. He wasn't enjoying his managers. He had lost his friends at work. Um, he was really unhappy, um, but everyone thought, oh, Max is doing great. He's performing really well. He must be fine. And unfortunately, enough time passed and, um, and Max ended up starting to look for a new job, um, eventually joined us. And when, I, when, I, when he joined and I said, you know, sounds like I, you know, it's rare to see somebody doing as well as you were at your last company looking for a new job, what happened? Um, he said this was totally preventable. If they had just asked, I would have told them and they would have easily been able to fix it, but they didn't ask. And by not asking, I knew they didn't care and they were unable to do anything. Um, and so in this way, there are all these cases where high performers are disengaged and that's, that's one of the highest risk situations. That's one of the most expensive situations at a company and it happens all the time. Um, and so the question that we think about a lot is how do you spot the max at your company? Um, and then when we are at Lattice, how can we help our customers or how can we help the community spot the people at their companies who are great at what they do, but for whatever reason aren't engaged and, um, and helping that employee find more purpose and meaning um, and engagement in their work is gonna be a huge benefit to that company. So there are kind of two angles to this. Measuring engagement can be done both from a qualitative side and from a quantitative side. So when we think of the qualitative side, we think of the stories that you hear. And these aren't stories like novels or short stories. These are the stories that you get from a one-on-one -on -one discussion with an employee, from ongoing feedback that you might notice in a group setting or in a private setting. This is from active listening. So uh, making sure that you're practicing really hearing what people are saying and not immediately translating what they're talking about into what you want to hear in your own head. And then on the quantitative side, we're going to talk about the data. So engagement surveys, ENPS, um, how can you look at performance data? And so those two pieces married together, both the sort of more human, more quantitative side or qualitative side around stories, and then the quantitative side where we can leverage data and software to help us identify these trends before they become a problem. Um, those are the ways with which we can measure engagement in the company. So to get started on the qualitative side, what can you do? So one of the most important things is one-on-ones. One-on-ones, in my opinion, um, and I think in, in a lot of managers' view, are among the critical tools that help you stay in touch with your employees, help keep a company aligned, help make sure that employees are engaged, that they have um, goals and that they have expectations and that they feel like they're working towards something common with their manager and their team. They're so unbelievably important. Um, and this is a great quote from Ben Horowitz, um, who said that these are the employees meeting rather than the managers meeting. Um, this is a free form meeting for all pressing issues, brilliant ideas, chronic frustrations that don't neatly fit into status reports, emails, and other less personal intimate mechanisms. Um, for any of you who know about active listening, this is a great time for managers to practice active listening and making sure that you are there to hear the employee, to be looking for the places where they might not be feeling engaged, where they might feel like they don't know how their work's connected to the company, where they might feel like they're getting burnt out, um, where they feel like their performance is slipping for reasons that aren't obvious. So the first thing um, is making sure that your company is having these one-on-ones on a regular cadence. Um, I don't think that there's, there, I don't think that there are many companies who are having too many. I think that it's almost always the case that you can encourage people to be having this forum. Another element of the qualitative side is learning through written feedback. Um, and so in addition to those one-on-ones, you also want to have venues for people to talk either real-time feedback that they can give to each other um, or performance reviews that are more structured. So um, the nice thing about these is often people are uncomfortable sharing what they want to share in an in-person setting. And so having written formats is a really great alternative. So we're all different. We all process things in different ways. We all share information in different ways. And so it's very important to couple one-on-ones with these venues for written feedback. And then the last thing, and this is more for the people ops team than it is for the managers, is conducting a listening tour. So um, I like the idea of this being a listening tour and I like the mindset that that puts one in, that I've kind of set out on a journey to go around the company and talk to people from different teams at different levels and to hear what they're thinking, what's on their mind and kind of have informal discussions across the organization to number one, display HR's commitment to 
listening to people, to designing the organization, to caring about how people are feeling, to number two, accelerate how much you actually know. So it's not just showing the employees that you care, it's actually learning more. Um, and then number three is gaining insights that otherwise might have been missed in the formal feedback settings. Um, this is something that we've certainly done here. I remember um, once several months ago, I spent three days just having one-on-ones with most of the employees of the organization. I think I had 35 or 40 uh, one-on-ones in a week. And it was really an awesome experience and I've never felt more in touch with the organization. And the truth is anybody can do this. Um, and you don't need to talk to every single person, but it's a really great way in addition to the engagement surveys and the one-on-ones and the performance reviews, which you should also do, but dedicating time to go on a listening tour is, is a really awesome experience that I think will help, that will help companies. So we talked about the qualitative side, now the quantitative side of how we can understand um, how our employees are feeling. So first is capturing ENPS with a sort of weekly sentiment score. Um, this is sort of good hygiene. It's not something uh, that takes a lot of time for employees. It's something that you can do in our software system or in others, but it's something that lets you feel the pulse of how everybody is doing. Um, and what's particularly useful is the ability to see big changes. So we're not all fives all the time. We don't all feel great. And sometimes we are gonna feel like a three or a two, and that might be okay. Um, but what you do want is managers who are in tune with their teams, who are listening for those things, and when they see a change, are able to have a conversation around it. So knowing the sentiment of your employees on a regular basis is super important. And then the other thing, of course, is gonna be engagement surveys. So anticipating and analyzing behavior Using engagement surveys is a really powerful tool to get cross sections of your company, to show them that you're listening to them, to look at different drivers of engagement like burnout, leadership, management, mission and vision, all of these sorts of things that make for an engaged uh, culture. Um, you can look at these through surveys. So you can design them yourself, you can partner with people who can help you design them, but taking the time to ask these questions is really valuable. Um, one interesting thing is that there are two elements. One is, of course, the data that you're going to get, but the other is just the fact that you are doing the survey will give you metadata. Um, in other words, it will give you information about the survey process itself that is useful to you. So at Facebook, for example, they did surveys, and it turned out that the surveys were twice as accurate predicting how long term uh, how long an employee tends to stay compared to industry forecasts. So if I'm Facebook and I want to know where, where do I have at-risk employees of leaving the company? I could look at industry reports, which is you know, a sort of easy way to do it, but it turned out that when they did surveys, it was much more accurate. So there is real signal in these surveys. And now on the right side, and this is something I find really fascinating, is employees who didn't participate in surveys were 2.6 times more likely to leave in the next six months. That's a huge difference. And so the data that you get from the surveys is really useful. But also the data you get about participation is really useful. We actually see something similar when we survey our own customers about how they're feeling. Would they recommend Lattice to a friend? And is this something that's useful for them? We actually find that the people who don't engage with us and don't respond to us, those are the people who haven't found out how to sort of receive the value that we want to deliver to them. And that's actually a really big signal in itself. And so you don't just look at the survey itself, you also look at the metadata. Um, similarly, um, similarly, it's the case that when you do this survey, there is going to be a message that comes along it, which is, we care, we're listening to you. And there's a group of people at the company who are thinking about your engagement and care really uh, deeply about the culture. So you want to ask questions that measure your culture. So your culture is often defined by your company values or your operating principles. Um, you'll know your culture better than anyone, and it's important to ask questions that um, relate to those different attributes of your culture. So in this particular example, we might have a culture who values commitment um, to what degree people are feeling valued, um, all these other sorts of things. And then you wanna ask questions around those things. Um, so let's say that you want to figure out um, to what degree um, management is effective. You might ask a question like, if I could choose, I'd continue working with my manager. Um, there's all sorts of questions that you can ask for each of these, and there's great research done at lots of universities. So in our case, we happen to um, work with the Uni University of um, California, Berkeley, and that was a really great place to do it. There's all sorts of information online, <coughs> but the key is that you take these different attributes of culture that you care about, um, and then you ask questions around those. 
And then you want to track engagement over time. And that's a critical element of this. You want to establish baselines that you can see how they fluctuate over the quarters, over the years. And so if we take it back to our example with Max, um, if you look back to Q3 of last year, we can see he was highly engaged. He was having one-on-ones with his manager. In Q4, those layoffs happened that I mentioned and Max started to feel disengaged. The next quarter at the beginning of this year, Max got a raise because he was doing so well, but it was kind of unclear who he reported to. Maybe he started leaving work a little bit early. Maybe he started speaking a little bit less in meetings that he used to speak a lot in. And then the next quarter he quits. And so if you don't pay attention to the signals, if you aren't asking Max how he's doing and having real conversations with him, um, it's gonna be really hard to notice these things. And so this brings us to how you can actually go about it. So when we talk about measuring employee engagement, typically when you run an engagement survey, you're gonna get data back. So this is a screenshot from Lattice where you can see each of these drivers on the left side. So these are the different sort of metrics um, or sort of elements that might lead to um, a healthy culture to an engaged employee. And within each of these sort of categories on the left, there would be a bunch of questions that someone had asked. And now here across the right, we'll be able to filter by different departments, by different managers, um, by gender, by age, by all this different sort of stuff. Um, and then you'll be able to see insights. So if you look at sort of these results, it's very apparent that the engineering team is struggling on the engagement side compared to the other teams. And so if I look at those things, I'll be able to see work relationships are a little bit weaker. Um, engagement is really low. People aren't feeling committed to the company um, in the way that other teams are. And so the engineering team is feeling burnt out for whatever reason. They aren't being able to uh, bring their best selves to feel refreshed at work. And so what you'd want to do from there is learn more about why. So you now want to follow up, have real conversations with managers, with engineers, and try to get to the bottom of it and then sort of you know, commit to the company to address those real issues. Another example might be if we looked on a manager basis. So um, here we can see that the sales team has a really strong manager, but the engineering team, uh, that manager is, you know, for whatever reason, struggling to make people feel valued, uh, to help people find, you know, commitment to the company, either through their hiring or through their management. Um, and so as a result, we'll want to have conversations with those managers. And then the last one that we want to show you, and this is the sort of new thing that we're really excited about, is connecting performance and engagement. So in the past, companies have been able to share the information that I've shared with you already. So things like engagement based on manager, or based on department, based on office or tenure. But what's really cool now is you can also slice engagement by performance. And so I could ask a question like, um, are our top performing engineers in the San Francisco office engaged? And that's potentially really powerful. Um, so by knowing how your organization is doing um, and feeling based on how they're performing, you're gonna be able to unlock a whole new set of insights that are gonna drive real business value. And that's really what this is all um, geared towards. That's why we wanted to build all of these products together is because we believe the data between them is so much richer than you get on its own. Um, we think that you know, employees are whole humans and the way that they're performing, the way that they're feeling are so deeply connected. And so we're really excited to, to bring those two together. So how do you improve management practices uh, to build an engaged workforce and what can you do? Well, to get started, I'm probably preaching to the choir here and I believe we all, um, we've, we've seen this a lot, but it's so true. Uh, managers are so critical for engagement. Managers account for 70% of the variance in employee engagement scores. Um, We've seen statistics that, you know, the number one reason by far is uh, for employees leaving a company is because they didn't uh, appreciate their manager. And so the, the lowest hanging fruit, the most powerful thing that you can do is improving the management at your company. So a few ways to think about that. Number one thing that we talk about a lot that really sticks with us and resonates is that managers should think like coaches, not bosses. You aren't telling people what to do. You aren't just pointing to tasks and saying, you do this, you do that. A great manager is more like a coach. And so what does a coach mean? It means things like creating a, winner, a winning environment. So create a place where people are set up for success. Um, it means setting clear expectations. So um, you don't want to just be pointing to this little thing and that little thing. You want to explain to people what you're looking for from their role, from their work this quarter. Um, and then you want to help guide them towards that. Um, by providing ongoing feedback. So you don't want to just ask for things to get completed. You want to coach people along the way. You want to say, you know, the way that you handled that meeting was great, except for uh, you forgot to engage half the room and that was a really important thing. And next time you should do that. Um, 
ongoing feedback is a great way to correct sort of small um, performances or behaviors because when you, you know, wait six months for a performance review to tell somebody, they've forgotten the incident, sort of the emotional resonance is lost. So ongoing feedback is super important. You also want to be accountable for your team. So you often will hear that, um, you know, praise should get pushed down and accountability should get pushed up. Um, great managers live by this. So you want to be the one saying, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to empower my team to do great. And if the team can't do great, then that's my fault. And as the manager, I'm going to be the one who's accountable for that. Um, that inspires trust from your team and inspires trust from the rest of your leadership. Um, and that's, that's a really important part of great management. Um, you also want to position your players for success. So a big part of this is, let's say you were, I'm, I, I know very little about baseball, but if you were a baseball coach, it'd be very important to put the right person at first base and the right person in the outfield and the right person uh, pitching. And similarly, as a manager, it's very important to align employees with the things that they love doing, the things they're good at, and the things the company needs. Um, and then finally, of course, a coach should collaborate to solve problems. So you don't just want to say, bring me the answer. You also don't want to do the work for them. You want to work as a team. Um, you want to find the cadence with your employees where you can coach them to collaborate to get better. So when you do set goals, it's important to set goals the right way. So you want to motivate employees with sort of a clear direction on how they can succeed. So what does that mean? When we think about employee-centric goal setting, we want to do a few things. We want to involve employees in the entire goal setting process. Um, this is a great way to get buy-in. By the way, involving people in processes is a great way to get buy-in across all sorts of different processes. So that's one important thing to do. We also want to link individual goals to business objectives. So there's nothing more frustrating than feeling like you're working on something that doesn't matter to the company, uh, that doesn't tie to its vision, that doesn't tie to its, you know, sort of highest level objectives. So as a manager, you want to help your employees see why their work matters to the overall company. Um, and then you want to celebrate completed goals for individuals in the company. So it's very easy to complete something and just immediately look to the next milestone. But it's really important to take a moment to reflect, to celebrate what was achieved, to acknowledge that, and to recognize that. Um, and on that point, uh, recognizing employee accomplishments is another really critical thing for managers, um, especially celebrating them publicly. Um, so, you know, so, a sort of adage that I really like is that one should criticize privately and praise publicly. I think that is in most cases totally true. Um, public praise is a really powerful way to give that employee the recognition at a broader level than from just you. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a cheap thing to do. It's easy. Um, and when it's meaningful, people care a lot. So you don't want to be throwing around praise just you know, for the sake of it. But when you have opportunities to recognize real accomplishment, sharing that at the company level is really great. So a few ideas for how to do that. Um, you can use tools like Lattice to have sort of digital praise walls where people can give each other um, sort of public recognition for things and that's shared um, in a channel publicly to the company. Um, you can also do things like employee awards. So a lot of times companies will have culture awards or performance awards. And these are things that you might celebrate at an all hands. And that's a really great way to, to go about this too. And then the last thing is team trips. So this is a picture, it's happened to be a picture of our wonderful marketing team. Um, and having time outside the office as a way to acknowledge a great accomplishment, a new launch, um, a really good quarter. Um, it's a really great opportunity to not only recognize it, but to give that team a moment to sort of bask and to enjoy each other's company and to get to know each other better. Um, and it's a, one of the best ways to build culture that I've ever seen. So when we think about these core business practices that drive employee engagement, we talked about managers who have all kinds of tools like one-on-ones, um, they can give periodic feedback, they can have weekly updates between them and the employee. We talked about goal setting, which is a great way to sort of align your employees' work to the company's mission. Um, and then of course we talked about praise. Um, and so all of that combined kind of is performance management in our view. Um, and so as mentioned at the beginning, performance management and engagement really do work better when they are thought of together. Um, all of these things that drive better performance um, and all of these ways to measure engagement, these things are so connected. And so if you can find a way to, through your culture, through your managers, through your uh, people ops systems, through sort of the way that you speak about these things, if you can make sure that employees know that they're seen as whole people and that there's a real connection between how they perform and how they feel and that the company acknowledges that and wants to make them successful both at work and personally, um, you'll get a really powerful experience. 
And so, you know, this with our sort of recent expansion that you might have seen into engagement surveys last month, um, that's really the sort of loop that we tried to complete here. Um, so we had all of the items on the left and now building out the engagement suite, we're really excited to see what that is doing for customers. And we've actually already been, been really thrilled to see how, how our customers are using that. So the key takeaways from this, and then we'll go into Q and A, um, is number one, performance and engagement drive each other. These aren't sort of in silos. These are things that are unified and that, that have a real impact on one another. Number two is that engagement data is a really great way to drive productivity at your company and to reduce employee turnover. And that, that has huge business results. Um, engaged employees will stay with your company longer. They'll be more productive while they're there. They'll drive a healthier culture. So that's really, really important and is really worth putting effort into. Number three is that combining quantitative and qualitative information is the best way to measure the health of your culture. So you want to look at the numbers, you want to run sort of the um, surveys and the feedback data that is available to you. And then you also want to make sure that your managers are listening to your employees, that you're listening to your employees, and that you're marrying both of these together to sort of get the best possible picture of how your culture looks so that you can take the most accurate steps to improve it. And then finally, um, you want to um, you, you'll be able to engage employees best um, if your managers have that coach mindset rather than the boss mindset. Um, and so those are our sort of main things for now. Um, and now we'd love to go into Q&A. And, &A and um, also, uh, we always love chatting to anybody. Um, we've got a community available, I should mention. So we have a Slack community where we've got over a thousand HR people. Um, it's an awesome place to talk about anything that you want. Um, and you can find that sort of on our site at lattice.com slash community. Um, we also have a bunch of articles, books, interviews that we do with thought leaders. Um, we have a bunch of webinars like this on our site. So um, if you want any more research resources, you can look at that stuff. Um, if you ever wanna chat with me, I love chatting with um, any and all people, operations people all the time. Um, it's part of why I love my job. So you can also feel free to shoot me a note. Uh, I'm Jack at Lattice and I would, I would love to talk to you too. All right, so I'm gonna jump into a few questions. Um, question one, we're a startup and we have a great company culture, uh, but we're growing quickly. That's good. How do we keep the sense of engagement that comes with a small company as we scale? This is a great question. So um, when companies are small, let's say, you know, 10 people, 20 people, even 50 people, um, it's easy to have engagement. And the reason is because employees have such an obvious sense of purpose. It's so obviously connected to the company. If you're a 25 person startup, um, Everybody at the company has clear visibility into leadership. The company goals are stated over and over. Everybody might be in the same room. And so as you scale, it gets harder. Um, and so the key to keeping a great, um, a great culture as you scale is to think about the things that drove it when you were small. What made it possible to have such a great culture when you were small? And then do your best to add those elements into your existing process while also thinking, what are the new ways we can engage employees now that we're bigger? So you're not going to be able to have everybody in a room. You're not going to be able to have everybody in every leadership meeting anymore if you're, you know, 100, 200, 300 people in the way that you were when you were a tenth that size. But you can try a lot harder to communicate. So you can think of two sorts of communication and transparency. You could think of push communication where you curate and share knowledge actively, or you could think of pull information where you make information available to the employees that are curious to see it where they can access it. And so that's one really great tool is to be really transparent and to share as much information as possible. Um, but you're also gonna have sort of new um, tools available to as a bigger company. You might have the resources for team trips. Um, you might be able to have manager training. You might be able to bring in experts from the outside. You might be able to hire leaders who can really teach the people at your company how to grow and improve. So my advice as you scale to maintain a great culture is to both you know, try to fight for and keep the elements that made your culture so engaged when you were small, and then try to think what are the new things that you have available to you now that you're larger and use the best of both worlds if you can. And in an ideal world, engagement only grows over time. Um, so good luck, and I'm sure you'll be able to find great paths. Um, someone asked, what is ENPS? I have not seen that term before. Thank you for asking that. So NPS is net promoter score, and this is commonly used in customer success land. Um, the way a net promoter score works is you ask, would you recommend our product or service to a friend? Um, and if you give a zero to a six or a one to six, you are considered a detractor. If you give a seven or eight, you're considered a neutral. And if you give a nine or a 10, you're considered a promoter. And the calculation of the NPS 
is how many promoters did we have minus how many detractors did we have and that's it. Um, so let's say you had 50% promoters, 30% neutral and 20% detractors, your resulting NPS would be 50% minus the 20% of detractors, so you get a 30. ENPS is the exact same thing, but for employees. The question is, would you recommend working at X company to a friend? Um, the idea is the same, that by asking people, would they recommend this to somebody else? Would they recommend either your product or service if it's a traditional NPS, or would they recommend working at your company if it's an ENPS? It's a great way to measure do people really feel strongly? Um, would people share this with a friend? Would they recommend that a friend or family works there? Um, and it's just a sort of great standard question that you can ask to sort of track the health of your culture. Okay, next question. As a smaller company, how do we gain the trust of the employees that these surveys will retain anonymity so that they can feel comfortable to share their opinions honestly? Um, it's a great question. It's really important um, that you explain that these are gonna be anonymous and that you then follow through on them. So. There's a couple ways. One is you can either um, do it yourself and be, you know, extraordinarily careful. Um, and you can, you know, if you've got the trust of the organization, you might be able to do these sorts of surveys yourself. Or you can work with a third party company that specializes in this sort of thing. So companies like Lattice are very dedicated to making sure that what we say is anonymous is actually true. Lots of other companies that provide the same sorts of services are too. Um, and so if you work with a dedicated service, they will, they will make sure that, um, you know, they'll, they'll make sure that it's their own number one priority that the way they say the product works is the way it works, in fact. Um, but it's really important that you do share with employees that the information that they give on those surveys will be anonymous, that people won't be looking at it um, in ways that, you know, tie back to their identity, um, and then that you follow through on that. So I have top performers who appear, this is the next question, I have top performers who appear unengaged. How do I work towards getting them engaged? It's a great question. Um, it depends, of course, and I know that's an unsatisfying answer, but it depends on the department. It depends on their tenure. Um, the key is to have conversations. That is, the, that is the sort of underlying truth of this, is that when an employee is disengaged, I really believe that the best solution is to have honest human conversations, to get out of the office, go for a walk, talk about it, and learn what's going on. It might be something in their life. It might be that their manager's changed. It might be that the work they've done has become boring to them and they don't feel like they're growing anymore. But there's always a reason. Um, and it's really important that you have a company where people are able to have these conversations, where people have the willingness to have those conversations. Because the only way you can know how to make something better is to know why it's going wrong in the first place. So with disengaged employees, my number one piece of advice is just to have a conversation um, from there. Um, you know, people ops leaders or managers, the, the, these are the types of people who are going to know what to do, but they have to, they have to be able to diagnose the problem first. Next question is, how should I get executive buy-in for running a performance management and employee engagement process? Um, so great question. So this is something that was much harder in the past than now. Um, I think that um, executives are starting to see the sort of very apparent value in having a great performance management process and doing employee engagement surveys and tracking that. Um, it depends a bit on who you are selling to. And so knowing the way that your executives work is really critical. So some will really want to see data. And so in those cases, there's boundless information around the ROI of employee retention, around employee uh, pr you know, productivity. There's so many studies showing that um, performance management, if done right, is useful to companies. There's so much information about why employee engagement surveys matter. And so it's not hard with sort of a bit of Googling or looking on resource sites like ours or others. Um, it's not hard to build sort of a quantitative case. And then you might also have executives where sort of a more qualitative appeal is going to be more effective. So people who you know care about culture, who were employees themselves at a previous company where they were frustrated in the past. Um, and so there's so much to say there as well. A lot of what we talked about in this presentation is sort of get towards that. Um, you could encourage executives to have conversations with frustrated employees of their own, um, sort of in the same way that I always say that the best way to get a product team to um, care about a feature is to put them in front of a customer who's struggling with that. And when you show people the pain of one of their like quote unquote customers, um, in this case, you know, an executive and an employee you might think of, um, getting that conversation going is another great way. So think about your audience, whether a qualitative case, a quantitative case or sort of a qualitative appeal is gonna be more effective and then start having those conversations. 
All right, next question. Um, and we're gonna do one more after this, so just two more questions. Um, what's your best advice for training new managers? Um, gosh, so there is, there's a lot of different elements of management. Um, and so it's important not to overwhelm um, because somebody who's just coming into a management role for the first time, who um, is usually there for a reason, they might've been a top individual contributor, um, they might have extremely high EQ and have, you know, you know, seem to have the sort of proclivity to do this. Um, there's so much to learn that the most important thing is to pick the fundamentals and to start there um, and then sort of build skills on top of that and skills on top of that. So one of the things I think is really important in training new managers is to remind them that all of a sudden the way that they're being measured has changed. If they've been an individual contributor up till now, everything about their sort of measurement and the way that their performance has worked and the way their career has progressed has been a function of how well did they perform the function of their job. Now as a manager, your whole paradigm is different and the way that you're being evaluated is the sort of performance of your team. And so that mindset shift is one that I think most new managers take a while to grok, um, but the longer that you can spend encouraging that sort of mindset shift, um, the quicker it'll happen. So I think that's one really important thing. I think another really important thing to instill in managers is that every employee is different. So it's very easy when you read content online, when you, you, know, you see this is the way to do management, uh, you read a management book, to think that a manager should have a style that's the same for everybody. And so the truth is that different employees are different when this comes to micromanagement versus hands-off, when it comes to, um, to what degree should I be leading you know, from the front versus leading from the back, to what degree should I be publicly praising versus to what degree does the employee find that you know, unhelpful and really just wants the critical feedback. So the key, I think, um, at a fundamental level is also to instill every employee is different and the manager's job is to manage different employees differently and that happens through conversations with employees. So those two things, um, treating employees differently and remembering that um, as a manager, you're output of the output of the team, those are two mindset shifts that I think are critical. Then in terms of building skills, um, I think there's great books online, uh, there's great articles online, there's great books to read. You can bring in management training if your company has resources for that. Um, you can expose them to this sorts of content. Um, you can also have them learn from other great managers at your company. So I would focus on the right types of mindsets and then on giving them sort of rudimentary skills. Uh, but I wouldn't go too far beyond that until sort of they've gotten comfortable with those and can move to the next level. So the last question is, why should we choose Lattice over a different software provider? Um, the first thing I'll say, and this is why I'm a bad salesperson, is you should choose, you should evaluate everything and you should choose the software that fits best for you. So without knowing what your problem is, what you're trying to solve for, what you're looking for, I couldn't necessarily say. Uh, there are other great software products out there too that do different things. Um, the thing that Lattice is great for is performance management and employee engagement and particularly combining those two things. Um, and so we are dedicated specifically to doing that for companies between you know, 30 and 1,000 employees. And if you fall into that category, we think that we're really great at that. Um, but there are other programs that you might need. So if it's things like um, learning and development or coaching or um, employee onboarding or other elements, Lattice doesn't provide those today. Um, so we are really focused exclusively on performance management and employee engagement. And that's kind of what we're about. Um, and then you should still kind of have a conversation with our team and, and we can talk through the specifics to see if it's a good fit for you. So I think we're gonna wrap there. This will be um, recorded, of course, and shared out with everybody. Um, so if you have more questions, reach out to us, send me a note. Um, we really appreciate you chatting with us with no pun intended engaging with us on this. Um, it's awesome to have a chance to talk to you all about this. Uh, and we're just, we're so excited to be um, getting into this kind of combination and to see, to see what happens next. So thank you all so much. Have an awesome rest of your day.